Most middle-aged fitness enthusiasts and athletes have been dragged down by joint pain, injuries, and other ailments commonly accepted as part of getting older. But it does not have to be that way. I can tell you from personal experience of today's book, anyone can conquer joint pain and rebuild their body. It simply requires understanding the hidden causes and a roadmap that this book today is that leads to the solution. Today's guest presents a paradigm shift in how to think about corrective exercise, sports nutrition, and joint health. Once you see how the system works, you'll never look at exercise or joint health the same way again. Today, I hope we'll have time to lay down the foundation for understanding why joints are breaking down and explore the five primary causes of joint pain, how to prevent the big three injuries that trap you in the pain injury cycle, why conventional pain management merely masks symptoms, and how to identify and fix muscle imbalances that lead to tension, pain, and injuries. And finally, natural injury recovery strategies that improve healing time and tissue repair quality. Now, we're not going to get near all those things, but at least we'll touch on them because this book has been literally a game changer for me, changed how I feel, changed how my muscles are, and I'm in better shape than I was even when I was playing professional sport. It is a great pleasure to welcome the author of Built From Broken, a science-based guide to healing painful joints. Scott Hogan, you're very welcome to the show. Thank you. That was a great intro. I appreciate it, Aiden. I firstly reached out to say thanks, and then I was like, I got to get this guy on the show. And I just want to explain why on an innovation show, you you would have a book like this. And I think it's the exact same thing, Scott, as it is with businesses that you have to get ahead of the disruption. So you have to build up muscle, you have to build up joint flexibility, you have to go through all a v- wide range of motions in order to pay it forward to yourself. So you're not going to be in that pain later on. That, that for me is the overarching strategy of what this book does. I think that's an important way to look at it and relevant for you and, and your listeners. You know, this is something that nobody gets a, a free pass on. You know, even in, you know, let's say in finances, you can hire a financial advisor and they can help you learn what to do with your money. But you, you kind of have to be, you have to have some understanding you're going to be in trouble. I think it's the same with your body. You know, even if you don't care about performance, like you're going to have to deal with things breaking down. Um, so knowing how to navigate those little injuries and those setbacks, how to prevent them, I think it's, yeah, it's important for everybody. So, so let's get started because I want to try and fit in as much as possible today. There's, there's so much in the book. It's like, it's got the, and, I, and most people will do, you know, I did it as well, Scott, they'll skip ahead to the program, but you go, don't, don't do it. Look at the strategy first, understand it first and understanding it actually helps you think about why you're doing it while you're exercising. And I think there's a mental aspect in doing it that way as well. So let's start with the way you do in the book, broken down, beat up, or bottlenecked broken down. These are the three categories that people fall into. You say say they're not separate categories, really. They're just different points on the same spectrum. Let's share what you mean by this, because this will encapsulate where people are for so many people out there listening. You know, I, I grouped into three main categories. And like you said, there's nuances here, but the, the first category, just the broken down, that's somebody who's got multiple injuries, chronic pain, they're basically destroyed, right? And that person has some urgency to figure this out. And those people are actually the ones that produce the most impressive transformations. I would say most people that I've worked with, they fall in that middle category where they're just kind of beat up. You know, maybe they're I'll say middle-aged. That means that can mean whatever you want it to, but I'm middle-aged uh, and you're going to have little nicks and dings, accumulated injuries. Even if you're mostly healthy, there's going to be some things that are holding you back, right? And then the last category, even if if you're a peak performer, everyone has a weak link. Everyone's got something, even if it's an injury that they've recovered from, maybe there's some scar tissue still around. They have to be cognizant of. So I think even the people that are not presenting as broken down or beaten up, they still are bottleneck. There's still something that if they released it, it's like, just like a true bottleneck or a kink in a hose, the whole thing's going to flow better. Let's talk about the title. Cause one of the things that caught my eye was actually the title in my own book, I wrote a chapter called Kintsugi thinking. And the, the art of Kintsugi is this beautiful art uh, in Japan where they, they celebrate the cracks. 
And I thought this is exactly what you meant here because maybe we'll give an overview of what the title means because it does have a deep significance. It, it means a lot to me because it's not, this would be a worse title because it's more wordy. It's not just saying I went from a, a state of being broken to a state of being built. You know, I, I try to explain this in the book, but I think people actually build, you rebuild with the pieces and that happens physically. You know, when, when you look at the way injury recovery works, you actually have to remodel some of the tissues that's been damaged. So if it's approached the right way, not only do you come out physically stronger, like you can actually turn a damaged joint into a strength. You can turn that into a strong suit. And then mentally, you, you know, you have resilience and this has become a big part of our mission at, at Salt Wrap in general, um, which I developed largely based on those built from broken principles is and using that, using that experience, that hardship, that adversity, and turning that into resilience. And that's kind of the the promised land, the end state that we're trying to help people get to. But yeah, I, I think that people can actually end up being stronger than they would have otherwise physically and mentally after going through this stuff, rather than just saying, well, it's part of life, you know, now my ankle doesn't work or my knee doesn't work. Yeah, and I think we've proven that with the right approach, you can actually be built from those broken pieces. I, I absolutely love the title and it really connected with me. And also the whole idea that you don't need to be a victim here. And that goes for, in this or in this show, we talk a lot about businesses doing that, that they accept that, oh, that's the way it is. It does not have to be that way. And, you know, I, I was on the edge of falling into that and kind of going, oh, I'll just live with these injuries. I was pushing my way through the injuries, pushing my way through the pain and coming out of training sessions in pieces until I read the book. And then I was like, I said, I'm just going to commit to this. And I started last December. And I can tell you, I feel like I'm in the best shape of my life. I just did a, I was telling you a load of battery of tests over in London, uh, brain tests for former rugby players. And my metabolic age is 30. And I was delighted with, with that as well. And I'm like, this is because of this work that I'm doing as well. Let's share in the book, there's five primary causes of joint pain and how your body's pain signaling system works and what to focus on instead of pain relief. There's a lot in there, but I'll give you that as a big one. So you bring it any way you like. Yeah, I'll start with those five primary causes. Um, you know, and they're kind of scattered in terms of the hierarchy of how things actually work. Because some of them are more fundamental, like deep layer cellular causes of joint pain, let's say. Where others are more, if, if you're looking at like a pyramid diagram in the shape of a triangle, they'd be more at the top, more symptomatic. Um, so I kind of mixed those and I'll explain why. But you know, I, I look at posture, uh, movement quality and variation, uh, muscle imbalances, tendinopathy being a big one, and then just general, I think I lumped together arthritis, uh, aging, collagen degradation altogether. So those are five things that are, like I said, at various points on that hierarchy of how systemically this works. But I, I grouped those together because I believe those are the most impactful focal levers for people to think about. What I mean by that is tendinopathy. It's just one type of injury, but it's the vast majority of injury causes around joints and pain around joints. So if you understand tendinopathy, you're going to prevent 80% of joint pain, you know, and that's, I mean, that's pretty clear, maybe not exactly 80% in the clinical data, but most joint pain that presents, it's, it's some kind of problem with the tendon, the myotendinous disjunction. So again, I tried to create focal points for the reader to look at and say, okay, this is what we're really diving into. Um, so yeah, those, those five things, I feel like if you can master those and that's your initial frame of reference, that's going to set you up to apply all the other principles to attacking those issues more effectively than just saying like, you know, here's all the potential causes of joint pain. And, and then let's link to that thing I mentioned there, which is the body's pain signaling system. And here it's the, really the myth of inflammation and the fact that, you know, and, and I've been through this, man, you, you get a dead leg or you get a bang on your knee, play, which you did every week. And it was only later in my career that physios would say, oh, no, don't don't take ibuprofen or don't take NSAIDs. Yes. Give it a day or two. Let the mus let the bruise come out and then apply the ice. But we weren't doing that, man. We were putting ice on straight away. People would become so accustomed to NSAIDs that we we took them all the time, man. And, and we did huge damage, including cortisone injections. Bring us through this, man, because this is so important to people. Yeah, yeah, it is. And that's 
I think that this has become more common knowledge than it was even a few years ago, but there's a lot of not just fitness enthusiasts, but health enthusiasts that pop in NSAIDs, ibuprofen. It's just part of their daily regimen. Take some with breakfast, take some with lunch. That's how they get through their workouts. And I'm not against it. It's a, it's an amazing drug when, when used properly. Um, but when it's just part of your routine to prophylactically prevent joint issues, like that means there's something wrong with your workout program, but more specifically relevant is the data that's come out on collagen synthesis and remodeling, how it actually prevents that process. So if you're taking NSAIDs every day, as you're doing this microscopic damage to your joints, it might feel better in the short term. And even I think some of the studies show over the medium term, like six to 12 weeks, there might be better outcomes in terms of recovery time and subjective pain levels. But in the long term, you're going to have less connective tissue mass and you, you expand this over a lifetime of working out and doing this, and you're going to end up with some brittle joint structures where they're most often stressed. So I think it's a big part of why you see a lot of these like specific connective tissue injuries in middle age, because we've just been beating ourselves, not letting our body naturally recover from it. We've been impeding that process. And then it gets to a breaking point where it is brittle enough to actually tear, you know, even if it's a grade one, you know, kind of sprain or strain. I loved the chapter on inflammation. It's essentially a whole chapter you dedicate to inflammation because I saw it as similar to in an organization. You have this, in organizations, people are bringing consultants to fix the symptoms instead of actually looking at why they're being caused. Or say, for example, you have somebody in the organization who's calling, there's trouble over here, the organization's in trouble. Or oftentimes they'll be seen as a troublemaker but they're communicating. They're trying to communicate the need for this. And I saw inflammation as this communication tool from the body signaling that there's something wrong. And in the book, you tell us there's three phases of inflammation. And again, really, really good knowledge to know this. And maybe you'd share this. Yeah. So I think what, what is helpful to use the insets for any kind of, um, any kind of inflammation modulating products, supplements, drugs, whatever, in that first phase, the acute phase, sometimes there's there's a way to use that. But once you get to where you've had inflammation that's, let's say, chronic in a joint or worse systemically for several weeks, like that's something where you really shouldn't be blocking that anymore. But yeah, I think to your point, that first, the first couple of phases are, are crucial for clearing out all that necrotic tissue that happens um, just from day-to-day -day stress and damage that happens to your muscles and, and joints from working out. So that inflammation clears out the necrotic stuff. It helps clean it up and it also ushers in new nutrients, new oxygen. So it's vital to the daily tissue remodeling process. So if you're just blocking that all the time, you're not getting any of that benefit. I think that what's tricky is there is, there's like a tipping point when it becomes more systemic and it can spill over, so to speak, you know, to the rest of your body, to other joints. So there's, there's some validity to modulating it. But I think the way to think about it is inflammation is healthy. And if you can get to a point where your body, um, the way you're training it, your recovery cadence, if it can naturally handle those inflammation spikes and cycles and you feel good and you're pain-free week to week, that's the best place to be in. But if you're redlining it, you're always in pain and you have to block inflammation, you know, that's, that's a problem, but you're also shooting yourself in the foot in, in the long term. And I just want to say, Scott goes through all a, a variety of other non-medical anti-inflammatories, for example, curcumin with black pepper, etc. I'll, I'll leave the, those people who are interested, check out the book and also check out Scott's website, Salt Wrap, for those of you joining us from the US and Canada in particular. And it's coming to Europe soon, Scott tells me, because they keep saying, when are your supplements coming over here? So he's working on that in the background. But another point was that I thought it was so interesting to understand the three main types of pain and how to differentiate between them because you show us a smarter way to approach pain management. You talk here about nociceptive pain, neuropathic pain, and centralized pain. Again, three terms that I hadn't heard of that I think are really useful to understand. Yeah, and I think when people think of pain, they're, they're thinking of nociceptive pain, which is just you hit your thumb with a hammer. There's tissue damage happening. Um, so that's a completely different process than a more neurologically based pain, you know, where it's, it's actually from your nervous system. And that's where you have to start thinking about signaling and you address it differently. 
and then centralized, meaning you've got, you've got your whole pain system is up. Like you're, you're triggered and now you're getting pain sensitivity throughout your body. So that's, that's a huge issue. But I think seeing that there's different levels of this and there's different categories helps you figure out how to approach it. You know, nociceptive pain, that's, like I said, it's more physical tissue based. Um, with neuropathic pain, you have to be more strategic here. And this is where you really have to start seeing specialists. There's some supplements that may be able to help with that, but that's a, that's, I don't want to say centralized to confute it with the other third category, but that's where the triggers and the causes are more deep layer in the nervous system. And then, yeah, that, that centralized pain, that's where you've been in pain so long and it's gotten so high that your pain sensitivity is through the roof and you're having trouble kind of having that intuitive sense of what good pain is, what bad pain is. Again, there was a brilliant, brilliant part you talked about here where you talked about how it's great that our brains are neuroplastic. It's great that our, we, can, we, we have neuroplasticity, but it can backfire on us, on us. And I thought this, again, was a great analogy for organizational change where some people have experienced some type of change in the, ba- in, the, in the past and it's given them fear. And then they're crippled by fear when it comes to changing again. Maybe you'll take us through this, how, how chronic pain can develop from neuroplasticity. It's been a while since I've worked one-on-one with someone, but this is how it convinced the more like knuckle dragging athletes and, and powerlifters that you can't just work through this stuff. Like you've proved, okay, you've proven to us, you're tough, you can grind through the pain, but even if you're getting through your workouts, there is some actual inhibition happening from pain. Pain is actually going to cause an inhibition in your central nervous system. So your muscles are not going to fire as efficiently as they would. You're not going to be as strong. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this. If you're having, let's say, elbow pain and you jump on the chin up bar, even if you're willing to go through the pain, there is some actual shutdown. I think it's called Golgi tendon organs. There's some actual shutdown mechanisms where it's turning things off to protect you from injury. So that's how we're able to convince some of our strength athletes. Like, okay, you're, you're, you're a hard dude, but we got to get you out of pain so that you can perform optimally. So that's something you can, you know, you can impact that even if it's been years and you do have these kind of wired patterns of experiencing pain and thinking about a certain way. I think we've proven that we as people, as humans are adaptable enough to rewire those patterns and a lot of it's tissue based as well. But, um, you know, that's, that's where it becomes more of a mental piece too, to change how we're thinking about it. And, uh, you know, one of the things you made me think was that we, we have our favorite exercises, we have our favorite routines. And one of the things I, I when I think about, we, we, you and I spoke before we started recording, the amount of time we wasted stretching, foam rollers, lots and lots of things like this. And one of the things I really wanted to get across to our audience today, and particularly, particularly, it's not about aesthetics. It, it helps. You do get the aesthetic benefit, that's for sure. But it's later in life because one of the most important things for later in life is muscle mass. And muscle mass mostly comes from weightlifting. You know what? This is where I said I was on the edge where, Scott, I was like, I'm going to take up Tai Chi. I'm going to do yoga. I'm going to do running. And I'm not going to do any weights anymore because that's obviously causing all the inflammation. And then your book, and I don't know how it happened, man. It it appeared in my Amazon serendipity. And I went, that's interesting because of the title. And then I was like, this is brilliant. It was sent to me because it did change everything when I started to focus on A, the slower movements, and then B, understanding that weight lifting, weight bearing is so essential to all benefits of health. Yeah. It's, um, I'm going to take us on a little bit of a side tangent because I've heard something come up a couple of times. You know, one of my, my favorite ways to think is constraint theory. There's a, a book from Eli, I can't remember his last name, it starts with a G, but it's all about this idea of focusing on an organization on the primary constraint. Now, any effort that's placed on any other part of the system that's not the constraint is wasted. And you can think about this a couple of different ways. I like the weak link in a chain theory, um, which is easy to understand. You know, if you, if there's a weak link, let's say it's an old rusty link in a chain and you strengthen and replace that link, you're not just fixing that link. The entire chain gets stronger, right? Um, a different way to think about it is, is the bottleneck or the kink in the hose. You know, if there is an actual kink 
uh, where the hose is turned, it's blocking flow. You free that, the entire hose, the water flows better through it. That's so, it's just as true in metallic chains as our kinetic chain. Um, so I think what happens with people, especially in middle age, injuries and pains start accumulating and it starts to feel overwhelming. And this, this is when you get the identity of, I'm just beat up. This is just how it is. But really, if you break it down, and that's what I did on the cover of the book, and I, this was a real analysis I did on my own problems, you can list out, and maybe not go down to every molecular detail of it, but you can list out, here are my issues. My left shoulder is this. I've got this with my Achilles. I tore my hamstring. You can list them all out and be brutally honest with yourself and say, what's my primary constraint? And what would happen if I addressed that? Like right now, my primary constraint is my Achilles. I injured it recently. So I know I can't get into a deep squat because my Achilles is jacked up, right? I'm changing the way I walk and run because of my Achilles. So my whole kinetic chain's thrown off. So when I fix this, and I will, I've done it before, everything gets better. So you do that. You, you just get brutally honest and focused about what you need to work on. You fix that, and then you move to the next thing because there's always something. So that's... That's a piece of advice I give to people that it's like, man, I'm, I'm just so beat up. Where do I start? It's like, find your constraint and fix, not fix it, just improve it and watch how everything gets better. All it, it doesn't take long either. You, you address that weak link and then everything lifts. Beautiful, man. And I thought we'd, we'd share a little bit more about the weight bearing because again, because, because of this myth of stretching or foam rolling and again a myth that i bought into and it was just the science is updating all the time and that's one of the things i loved about your book you you draw from everywhere and you draw the book is full of studies to back up everything that scott's saying it's science backed as he says in the subtitle and this part about weight bearing and also the importance of muscle when you're older is essential yeah i think it's the number one predictor of mortality is muscle mass I think above all other factors, I could be wrong on that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it is. If it's not, it's in the top three. Um, but yeah, it's something we take for granted. You know, you can have muscle when you're young and you lose it when you're older. Um, but it's, it's so important for, for the main thing is balance, especially in advanced age, having balance, you have to have some muscle mass, but even, you know, through middle age, uh, to keep your metabolism humming, to keep your fat burning potential up to keep, you know, markers of, of blood sugar health in line, you need muscle mass for all that. And so that's another thing where we accept a lot of times that it just declines with age and it does, but you can combat that. You know, if you're weight training consistently, even if you have it in the first part of your life through middle age, um, there's, there's been studies on seniors that put on like obscene amounts of muscle from training when, when they never have. So yeah, it's, it's pretty much the ultimate anti-aging hack. I think above all else is you're, you're lifting weights, you're building muscle, maintaining it in age. Now you have maintained bone mass and joint health. Um, if, it, if it's done the right way, it is, it's tantamount, you know, to, to healthy aging. And the other thing you mentioned as well is the weight bearing actually increases bone density, which again, stops brittle bones when you're older. But most people actually crack the bones because they fall because they don't have the muscle as well as the brittle bones. Yeah. And you gotta, ha you gotta have that with age. You're right. It's, um, a sedentary lifestyle without load bearing. Even walking, you know, there's some studies that show walking, that's some kind of load bearing, it's low intensity, load bearing exercise, that's going to help with bone density. Um, but you really need to stress the joints um, pretty heavily to trigger that bone remodeling process, osteoblasts, where you're actually building more bone matter, that requires heavy weights, like six, seven, eight repetitions, and you're pretty much maxed out. And a lot of people don't do that. They don't care about building muscle, they just want to stay healthy, so they, they go... 20 reps super light um, but they're missing out on some of the best anti-aging benefits from doing the heavier weights including cognitive benefits you talked about the osteoblast but there's also neurogenesis that happens yeah it boosts a uh, brain derived neurotrophic factor bdnf which they i think a lot of people refer to it as fertilizer for your brain um there's a book called spark that goes into detail about how exercise builds you know your cognitive function but yeah, there's, there's so many second order benefits. It's really amazing. There's a term you, you introduced as well that I hadn't heard about. You mentioned it several times throughout the book, mechanotransduction, which I thought was important. Yeah, absolutely. There's a, an author, her name's Katie Bowman, and she's written extensively on just the benefits of movement. Um, I think she's one of the, the foremost experts on movement in general. 
But yeah, it's basically how your body translates movement into a physiological response of building tissue and rebuilding tissue. And it's, it, I still have trouble wrapping my mind around it, but our body actually converts motion into physical matter. And that's the process where that happens. So, you know, weightlifting is one thing, but when you look at all the nuances of daily life and the way we move and twist, that's going to create millions of, of micro physiological rebuildings throughout the day. So that's how you end up with a balanced physique, you know, balanced mobility is variation of movement. Um, but that's also a super important concept for injury recovery. Like you have to move it and stress it in order to trigger that healing response. There's another term that, another idea that you brought to mind for me, which is the, the idea of the variety of the exercise. So you mentioned, for example, walking. And I, I love this where you talk about later on that you need to stress the muscle from as many points as possible because you get this overuse injuries. For example, I'm a baseball player. I'm a, I'm a pitcher and I'll get arm injury. I'm sure you've got your, your tendon, your Achilles from some reason for, for, from that type of overtraining. But there's a, a phrase, there's a, a little excerpt here that I wanted to share. And this will upset some people because when you said this is wrong, I was like, going, oh man, that's going to annoy a lot of people. Cause I used to do this. You say, ask any fitness buff about the best way to build muscle and get into shape. And they'll tell you to follow a bodybuilding a bodybuilding routine involving training one or two body parts per day with high volume to spur muscle growth. A typical week might be Monday chest, Tuesday back, Wednesday arms, Thursday shoulders, Friday legs. My, my son is at this stage and I'm trying to tell him that he's not listening to me. Well, to be fair, you know, you look at the, the best bodybuilders in the world, this is what they're doing. They're following a split like this, but not everybody wants to be a bodybuilder. Um, but I would challenge even people that do, and even if this is their favorite thing to do, I'm like, just work with me for, for one week out of every four or one, one week out of every eight, do this, come in. And this is kind of the built from broken split where you're doing more of an upper lower body, um, training split, but you're focused more on movement patterns rather than just killing the muscle. So yeah, I'm not against it. I mean, I'm not a bodybuilder clearly. Um, but this, this seems to be a sticking point for a lot of people. They think they have to do this. They, they have to go in and just kill their chest every Monday. You know, that's why there's no bench press machines available every Monday. And then they wonder why, like, man, every Monday, the front of my shoulder is killing me. Like, well, we're not doing anything to counterbalance that. We're not working any antagonists. You know, we're not building the structural support behind your shoulders. So I think there's, there's a lot of reasons to not do that. But, you know, to be fair, if you want to build muscle, that high volume approach that's muscle part focused, it has its place, but if it's not working for you, you know, it's, you, you got to try something different, even if it's a temporary deload or a temporary shift into a more corrective focused routine. So that's what I would say to somebody who's kind of on the fence. Like if it's working for you, keep doing it. But if you're having issues, you know, try something else. You might be surprised. You might like it better. Most people who have had an injury will have gone to physio and got a rehab program, may or may not have done it. That's the other thing. Many people don't follow up with the advice of the physio. But what I love about this, about your whole book is most of that is throw in a couple of rehab sessions at the end of a session, but you make the session out of the corrective, uh, corrective exercises. And there's, there's huge benefit in that. And you mentioned, for example, bench for me you like the sessions you do on the slow movements for your back. My bench got much higher when I went back. So as you say, it's like a step back to go two steps forward. It's like a slingshot. And I, I love this aspect. And maybe you'll, you'll unpack this because this was one of the core findings of your, of your book and indeed your approach. I think a lot of people are hesitant to spend more time on corrective exercise or mobility. They think it's a waste of time or it's detracting from what they really want to do, which is build muscle or build strength. And fair enough. Like if you're just going in and you're standing on a BOSU ball and you're, you're balancing a band on your head for 30 minutes, it's not a good way to use time. Or if you're foam rolling for 15, 20 minutes, like that, that's not a way to use time. But what I challenge people to do instead of, like you said, sprinkling in corrective exercise at the end of every workout or just using it when you're hurt, let's try flipping that paradigm on its head. Like what if you made... 90% of your workout corrective exercise and 10% of it was the traditional, you know, fun, like bench press or Rashid's like, what would happen? Like, well, there's ways you could structure that to where 
you wouldn't see much progress, right? You might actually lose some steps when it comes to building muscle in your fitness. But what I tried to do with Built From Broken is build these corrective exercise routines into a more traditional strength and endurance routine where you're accomplishing those kind of main goals of building muscle and strength, but you're also helping support the antagonist, you're building joint stability. I'll give you an example, you know, for shoulders, you can go in and do instead of military press, the bottoms up kettlebell press, which I love. It's one of my favorite exercises. You do that right, you're gonna be stressing everything. You're gonna be feeling the strength workout aspect. You're gonna build muscle if you do it right, but you're also gonna be frying a lot of the stability muscles. Um, you know, Max Shank, he has a, a saying, a lot of people, they have too much horsepower and not enough power steering. So this is one exercise where you have to have a really strong power steering. So you, you may not be able to go as heavy as doing a military press, but you build your workout around exercises like that. It's man, this has got a corrective component. I'm going through the full range of motion and it's challenging my muscles in the way that I want. You build a workout from that. That's a whole different ball game. Now you can, you can kind of have it all. You can build the muscle, build the strength, reduce the pain. It just takes some really strategic exercise selection to do it that way. Which is all in the book, by the way. And I do that exercise thanks, thanks to you. And you do, you start off really low because it's like you have to balance your wrists as well, get a serious workout. But the strength comes pretty quickly. I mean, it, you go through it for a while, your brain's learning what the heck's going on here. So you get it. I also feel with your sessions, you're getting this brain workout. Yeah, you can slog through a workout of machines. I mean, I like machines as much as anybody else. They have their place, but you can slog through that. But when you're doing something like that, you know, you're doing a, let's say a Bulgarian split squat, you're on one leg, you're holding a kettlebell, you have to be focused. You can't be worried about the problems at work or whatever, or worried about what song, you have to be fully focused. So there's, to me, that's one of the biggest things I love about the gym is I can get out of my head. So this is a way for you to fully be present and aware of what you're doing. Um, and it increases, there's benefits to that too, right? It's like the mind muscle connection, improving your, your balance and the kind of proprioceptive awareness of where your leg is, that all gets better with this exercise. Whereas if you're just sitting on your butt doing leg press, you're not getting any of those benefits and you're probably still worried about the problem at work or, you know, whatever else. And, and the other thing there, just while we're on this, is that it's the variety, not just for your head and, and for keeping you interested, but you talked later on about the fact that walk, it, it's doing the, the NEATS as well. I'll let you, let you tell our audience what NEAT stands for, but doing other things around it, because we have such a sedentary lifestyle that we, we don't walk as much, we don't cycle, we don't pick things up as much as we used to as well. And it's the variety of all these things because you're constantly flushing out toxins as well, even by walking. Uh, NEAT stands for non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And most of our, our actual caloric burn or metabolism comes from this non-exercise activities, things like breathing, you know, your brain using up glucose. So people like to think of exercise as being how they burn calories, but most of that calorie burn technically happens outside the gym the rest of the day. But yeah, you know, our... our you can go through your week and not really ever be uncomfortable. You sit in your chair and you go sit in the car and you sit down for dinner, you sit at work. Um, so I, I put a lot of emphasis on structuring lifestyles to add a lot of that movement variation in. Like one thing I I have, I call movement cues, kind of scattered all around. My kids will jump on them too. We've got, you know, little balance boards. So you're walking by and you'll see our kids jump on it and they'll wobble for a second and keep going. And I've got uh, a slant board in the year, so I'll if I feel a little tension, I might stretch on it. So, I mean, I'm not saying just scatter stuff all over your house, but it's something to think about. It's like, how am I designing my day so that I am moving in different ways, you know? And I, you have to be intentional about that because life by default is moving everything down to here and reducing variation, not increasing it. I love that, man. And I learned again from that. I have like the the pull-up bar in my kid's room and they, and they do them as a result or they'll just hang and stuff like that. The stuff that... Obviously, if it wasn't there, they wouldn't do. But uh, we, we better mention, before I forget it, supplementation, because I'm a big believer in supplementation. People, people always see me drinking during the show. And like, for example, I have collagen mixed with greens here. And I, I take the collagen, as you told me as well, take it before my session. And I, the way I kind of think about it then is the collagen will help then when I train, because I'm basically like shaking the collagen around in my body and it will kind of trickle around all over the place. 
Well, you better better give us a few of maybe your top supplements that are both you both from a salt wrap perspective, but also why you chose these supplements. I didn't uh, plug those much or maybe at all in the book because that drives me crazy when you're reading a book and it's like, oh, okay, now I go to, to read your course and I've got to pay more money for this. So I talked about a lot of the, the principles and didn't mention specific products. So that was on purpose. But, you know, a lot of the, actually every supplement was built on the same principles that I used for Built From Broken. So yeah, I'll touch on collagen because that's a hot button one. You know, years ago I wrote an article uh, for a different website about how collagen's a scam, basically. It's kind of being contrarian. Um, it's not up anymore, but I still stand behind it. It's, it's one of those supplements where you see, oh, it's good for, for gut health and joint health and brain and your eyes and your skin and your teeth. And it's like, hold on, how can something be good for everything? And I think I, I'll set aside the case that it's beneficial for all those things. But one thing that I'm convinced of now from the clinical data and from my own experience is using specific types of collagen for joint health. Uh, and this is getting really narrow here, but I think it's important. You know, with collagen, it's not so much about the protein, it's you, your body's physiological response to consuming the collagen, or more accurately, detecting collagen peptides in your bloodstream. So when you take collagen, um, the one we use that has uh, patented types of collagen that are studied specifically for tendons and ligaments, so it's more targeted, what happens is, it kickstarts uh, collagen biosynthesis, which is new collagen production. So I think there's this misconception that you drink the collagen and it just kind of goes and packs into your joints. That's not exactly what happens. It's more about how your body responds to it um, and the signaling process. So that kind of, you, you can probably tell I'm obsessed with principles. That fundamental thinking of trying to get to the bottom of the root of everything, that's behind everything we do. So we have a collagen supplement. You know, we have a protein that's that's based not just for muscle recovery, but total body recovery. Um, we have a joint supplement that's really focused on injury recovery and addressing every aspect of that. So I'll say this about our, our supplement line. Nothing there is just designed to address symptoms. Everything goes to the very root, uh, deep cause. So that's that's what I'm kind of obsessed with from a product development standpoint is finding like not just ways to put Band-Aids on it, but let's see if we can actually get to the bottom and fix this. One of the ones that I'm really after is your magnesium supplement because the, I, I suffer from cramps still and, and I do take magnesium, but I can't find the right formula that will stop the cramps. And I and I do your sessions as well, but like when I'm holding, for example, on a calf raise, you know, when you say squeeze at the top, my, my cramp, I'll get cramps or, or doing the, the Swiss ball hamstring curl. I get cramps all the time and it drives me nuts. You know, it's not all bad. That's... uh that means you have a good mind muscle connection. Like you should be able to flex your bicep and cause it to cramp. And bodybuilders can do this. They can put themselves in pain. Whereas somebody who's not trained, it's like, I, you know, I'm not feeling that. So, you know, I think part of that, it's, it's not all bad. It means you're, you're a developed athlete, but yeah, we have a couple different products for cramps. That's our most popular one. It's called mag R and R for night leg cramps. So it, it's got magnesium, but it has some other things that help with, uh, kind of restructuring your sleep cycle and helping people get deep sleep. And then we have a daytime one as well called mag 3d. Um, I don't know if you have access to these, but that mag 3d might be good for you for daytime. So you're not getting sleepy. Well, I don't hear in the, in Europe, but many of most of our audience are in the U S and Canada. So th those guys can, those guys can find you, but, um, I I'd love to fit in a few more, few more things. We've about eight minutes left, Scott. And, uh, I, I'd love to talk about, because again, I'm being a bit selfish here as well. I've, I've had knee injuries and you talk a lot about synovial fluid, for example, and the take out home message being that activity is the driving force behind joint lubrication. This is something that's kind of counterintuitive for people. I've got a sore knee, therefore I won't lift heavy. And this is where it all falls down for people. Yeah, it becomes a kind of negative, vicious uh, cycle, a positive feedback loop where, you know, if you're feeling stiff or you're feeling pain, you're, you're not going to move as much. And what happens is your body produces and circulates less synovial fluid, which is like the grease in your joints, basically. It's the fluid that surrounds your, your joints. So you can see this process. You're having some issues, like, well, that's hurting. I'm going to stop doing that. So then you get less synovial fluid circulation, less structural support. And by the way, that synovial fluid is rich with 
other, you know, growth factors and, and, um, things that actually help with the healing process. So then you have even less synovial fluid, you're in more pain. So it becomes this downward spiral. So it's tough to get out of, especially for an aging athlete, but you know, whatever movement you can inject into the joint that's injured without pain, or let's say a pain that's like a three or less on a, a scale of one to 10, that's going to help with that synovial fluid production and circulation. But yeah, you don't hear much about it, but it's a huge factor with, with joint health and pain in general. And a lot of the studies, again, you talk about talk about that that in the past people thought you couldn't stimulate growth of of cartilage, for example, and tendons. But you again show that that's not true in the book with lots and lots of studies. But I I wanted to share something as well because again, so much of it spoke to me, and I'm sure it does for many people who read it. Because when I was trying to recover from a knee meniscus surgery where I had the knee cleaned out, I used to explain to the physio that it, it felt like my knee was going to explode when I did a squat or something like that, or even when I did a, a, a quadricep stretch. And and it still does in some ways. And you talk about in the book, it, and I was like, going, oh my God, that's, that's exactly what's happening. It was a concept called hydrodynamic pressure and synovitis. Synovo- synovo- synovitis yes yeah, so no uh, i'll say this instead inflammation of the synovial membranes synovitis i mean this is where i'm i'm probably towing outside my sphere of competence uh because i haven't worked with a lot of people that have this um and it's super hard to detect but you can actually get infections you know around your joints and i think it's pretty rare but you know if, if you're having prolonged swelling and those symptoms you describe that could be what's going on you might actually have an infection in there. And it presents almost like stiffness or almost like not enough synovial fluid, but you might actually have too much. There might be, you know, a, too much effusion where it's injecting too much in the joint, causing too much pressure. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really, it's a tricky thing. And this is where you have to lean on specialists, but from a practical perspective, just understanding that, you know, motion is the lotion. Like one of my friends who's a physical therapist says, like, you have to find a way to keep moving. Um, you know, even if you have to alter the way you normally would move. Oh, great, man. Well, listen, we'll keep going because I, I, again, the one of the big, big takeaways from the book is collagen, not just as a supplement, but what you talk about collagen synthesis. And you t- take us through four stages of collagen synthesis and how collagen relates to connective tissue health. Again, huge knowledge for people where most people focus on the muscle. But if you actually start looking at your body as the collagen joining all the muscle, it's a totally, it's a paradigm shift, as I said in the intro. Yeah, yeah, it really is. You can start to see like, oh, I have control over some of these things, right? Um, I'm not, because it's, this is, there's a few spots in the book where I felt almost out of my depth, like, should I even write about this? So I, I reached out to some some experts, you know, people like Jill Cook, and, and I got some great feedback um, so there were spots where I was like, I really had to do my research and make sure I was speaking accurately. And that's one, it gets really heavy. And then to try to explain that in a way that's practical and, and you can actually take something from it's difficult. But if you picture a bundle of straws, so you're, you're at a restaurant, you're at the counter and you grab a bunch of straws, that's kind of how collagen's formed in your body. And so there's this cross-linking process that happens that would attach, let's say each of these straws to each other. And some of that's good, that creates connective tissue integrity, but problems occur when you get too much cross-linking or there's an overabundance of tissue assimilation that causes what's scar tissue, you can start to see the structural problem of like, okay, now these things can't slide back and forth easily, right? They're not as pliable because they're all junky and and mixed up. Um, I have another graphic in the book and instead of your collagen being shaped like this, it's all like this, like they're wrapped around each other. So. From a practical standpoint, once you see how that works and you see what healthy collagen structures look like versus collagen that has scar tissue formations, you can see like, oh, this is why we need to break this apart. So a collagen fiber is actually, it's more like a a bundle of straws than it is a separate compound. Again, I'm, I'm at risk of going out of my depth a little bit here, but I think this is helpful to visualize this and see like, okay, these are actual, there's structural building blocks to this. And you can see the problems. You don't have to worry about this other um, infographic, but you can see the problem when these things get jumped up when they start binding to each other. So what do we do about that? Well, that's where this heavy, slow resistance, very slow eccentric, meaning focusing on the down portion of an exercise, 
what that does is actually breaks a lot of those cross links and gives your body an opportunity to repair them and the correct kind of alignment. So that's what we do with tendinopathy recovery, injury recovery in general is you're actually breaking down some of those so tissue fibers and helping them remodel appropriately. So that's, I think that's the big takeaway. The other thing that's interesting is um, the process of collagen degradation. You know, some of that's good. There's a turnover process that happens. That's not all bad, but I think what, what people need to think about is what am I doing? What's the input I'm doing to help build new healthy collagen fibers in my joints? In the same way that you go and lift weights for your muscles, you should be thinking, what am I doing to build my joints? So that's kind of a baseline principle that helps you apply everything else in the book. One of the most important injury prevention lessons in the book, you say, is to take this away. And and again, this is one of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show is because many, many people who listen to this show are knowledge workers. And they sit at their desk and they use their brains and their maybe only movement in the day might be if if there is stairs in their office building, they might walk up the stairs at home or they might walk from their commute to their office if they're going to the office. And this is again why I thought this was so important. But you say being sedentary all week and then playing golf or tennis on the weekend is the easiest way to get injured and develop joint pain. Even within daily time periods, being sedentary all day and then exercising intensely for one hour will lead to injury. It might show up as tendinopathy or it might be an acute tear or sprain, but it will happen. It's, it's a tough one because this is something I deal with personally. I'm at my desk a lot. I'm a knowledge worker, uh, you know, these days more than uh, actually physically being in the gym doing training. But there's there's a few reasons this is problematic. You know, one is just the, the whole process of priming your body for movement. If you shortchange that at all after a day of being sedentary, you're, you're just going to be set up for failure and injury, right? But over time... It's easy to develop muscle imbalances when your lifestyle is sitting at a desk and then going and let's say weightlifting at a gym for an hour, which a lot of people do. But as I as I track people's habits, that's almost the rule now. It's like you're at a desk all day, in the evening you go do your weight training or whatever. Um, so I think one of the most important things to realize is that what we do in the gym or what we do when we exercise, it's a tiny percentage of the day, right? Even if you spend 20 minutes stretching your hamstrings and your hip flexors, how long are we sitting at our desks in the shortened position? Like you just can't compete with that volume of, of load and constricted movement that we have day to day. So what do we do about this? You know, there's movement snacks has become a popular term, finding ways to get up and move. But I think maybe even more important to be uh, really intentional about it is how do I counter train against the things that um, are problematic from my lifestyle. So if you're sitting at a desk, your your butt's going to be turned off. Your glutes are not activated. They don't need to be. You're on a chair. Your hip flexors are short. You're probably slumped forward a little bit. So you can just pick out a few joint systems and say, okay, these are things I need to work at daily. This is part of my daily routine now. I'm going to open up my hips. I'm going to get into some deep deep lunge positions. I'm going to do some, some glute activation exercises, which will do a lot for low back pain. I'm going to make sure that I'm doing some stuff to open up my chest and activate the back of my shoulders. So that's what I challenge people with is the knowledge workers, which is a huge part of our, our customer base. Like if you're sitting at a desk all day, make sure when you get to the gym, your first priority is doing something to move the, the goalpost back the other direction towards where it needs to be naturally. Because if you're just going right into your workout day after day, you're gonna accumulate a lot of muscle imbalances, restrictions, and that's, that's gonna lead to injury couple of last things I wanted to share. And by the way, I have the book there behind me on the shelf. I'm I'm actually heading to a session afterwards. That's why I'm sipping away on my collagen here. <laughs> and one of the other things is Scott tells us in the book, like there's a, there's a morning routine. It took me a while to get the morning routine going. I started off just doing the the, the five exercises with without weights. Then there's another that you do with weights. It only takes about 10 minutes. But what I do is I, I combine that with something that I learned from Andrew Huberman, who, who's a great supporter of our show. He sends lots of audience our way about getting outside and getting light. So w I live in Ireland, Scott, so the w we don't always have the weather to let that happen. <laughs> but I try and get outside and do just do those stretches in the morning. But even 
from our conversation today, I didn't realize that one of the benefits is not, it's not just because I've been in bed all night and I need to stretch, but it's actually just the variety of the movement again throughout the day. So that was really important. But one of the things that I just, I, I thought was so interesting, many people may have experienced this and this is really useful. I'm going to keep this in mind with my children is for example, you talk about how injuries happen at the end of the season, for example, because it's, it's a lot of overuse. So one of the things that happened to me was when I played sport, if I had been injured, then you're on the bench, right? So you're, you're, you're riding the pine for a while, trying to get back in the team. Then you get back in the team and then you get a different injury and you have all this kind of what you think are the, oh, I just can't get out of this loop of being injured all the time. But it's because you have that sedentary sp uh, space and you're not using all your muscles all the time. And you say, this is new science as well, where you have to be training to, to, it's not about resting before the big Friday night lights. You have to be training to a quantity that will actually allow you play on a regular basis. And this is, this is upending the entire model that was there before. Yeah, it really is. And this is, you know, the best in the world are doing this. You look at LeBron James, his, his schedule and his training schedule, the amount of volume of stress and training on his body, it's, it's ridiculous. But he didn't get there overnight. Like this is, it's a very slow accumulation of volume. And, you know, one thing that people ask me, like, what would you put in the book if if you were, were doing another edition? And maybe I will at some point is this idea of route, not destination being the real healing lever, you know, it, you're not able to perform at that volume of work and stay healthy because you're doing it at that moment, because you're just doing it. That There's a process to get there where you are slowly building tissue tolerance and all the other tools you need, you know, the awareness, kinesthetic awareness, understanding of how your body recovers. It's a, it takes a long time. So I think people see these like heroic levels of volume and Cal Ripken levels of like consistency, um, but it takes it takes a while to get there. So yeah, if your point, you know, from week to week, just increasing volume, no more than ten percent. Anything beyond that, and your injury risk skyrockets. So you have to give your tissues time to acclimate, especially connective tissues because they're slower. Um, but yeah, it's it's really interesting. There's a science to this, and they can quantify like you just go over this threshold, and injury risk goes through the roof in terms of a variant. Five to seven times you tell us in the book. I love your story about the Navy SEAL, for example. This this really brought it on. Maybe we'll share this as a final story today. I think what one of the most impressive things about you know, these elite special forces, I'm just super fascinated by these guys, is the amount of tissue damage that they can withstand and not just be crippled. And the truth is, you know, there's some amazingly talented applicants that they, you know, they watch out because they got injured. But what I talk about in the book is twins. They both end up being Navy SEALs. But, you know, you look at what they do, and it's crazy when you look at the volume of work they do, not just during Hell Week, but throughout their entire careers, running with these, you know, heavy packs and just all kind of the most, like, kind of dangerous positions they're putting their joints in. Um, and somehow they're not just constantly rupturing their Achilles. Their knees aren't just completely disintegrating. There are a lot of injuries um, that they have to go through, but what I talk about in the book is that that kind of training, that's not possible by just starting, you know, when you're in your 20s. That's something that you accumulate that over decades. So it, one of my favorite books is Lone Survivor, and, and Marcus Luttrell talks about when they were kids, they started training with, with a neighboring man, um, doing these long runs, carrying blocks, doing these long swims. So from the time they were little kids, they were already building an insane level of connective tissue tolerance to where as adults, now they can handle that level. Whereas I go out and I start doing that. I make it three hours into hell week and I've probably got like four different ruptures, you know, in tendons, but this is something that they built over a lifetime of, of training. It, it was a great story as well for innovation. So I'm going to try and turn it to that to try and <laughs> try and justify it. But it, the whole idea is that you got to be doing the work before you need it. So there's a great, Spartan warrior mantra, the more you sweat in times of peace, the less you bleed in war. I love that. And, and I actually, I, I take that as a lens through which to read your entire book, because 
for me now at my stage, I'm going, this is about building for the Friday lights, night lights of when I'm 80, 90, 100. Because I, if I do live to be that age, I don't want to be in pain. I, I, well, I know there's a certain amount that you got to take with it, but at least do the work now so I can pay it forward to myself then. And if my 100-year-old self was to come to me in the mirror and go, man, thank you for doing this. I tell you what, man, I tell you what, your book will be one of the reasons I go, thanks, Scott Hogan. He helped me out massively, man. So I, I'm absolutely grateful for you writing the book and for sharing your wisdom with the show. Scott, I, I mentioned Salt Rap a few times. I, you're very generous with your blog. You give away a lot of resources there. Where can people find you? The best place is just saltwrap.com. So that's S-A-L-T-W-R-A-P.com. Why the name Salt Rap, by the way? It's a good question. I, I get that a lot. Uh, so when I was a kid, I was injured all the time as a kid too. And my mom, you know, she she was way ahead of her time. She was talking about bone broth and, and blood sugar way before it was popular and preservatives way before they had science behind it. Um, but she she would do something when I would injure myself or have a pain and create these like Epsom salt baths. I don't know if you've ever done that, but it helps with inflammation. And I remember banging up my knees and elbows and she would take gauze or, or clots and soak them in Epsom salt bath water. So warm water and Epsom salt, wrap them around the joints and it would help with inflammation and pain. So it, you know, like a salt wrap, not the kind that you put around your belly to supposedly get rid of belly fat. But this, this idea, it just stuck with me for whatever reason. And it be, kind of came a metaphor for a natural therapeutic method of doing something that works with your body's natural, you know, chemistry that's good for you. You're not just throwing anti-inflammatories on it, but at the same time, it's also helping you get back out there, like get back on the field. The whole reason I did it was so I could go keep playing. So we're not here to just, you know, put people in a brace and say, Hey, you're fixed, right? Go sit on the sidelines. People want to get, they want to get back on the field. They want to get back on the court in the game. So that idea of this salt wrap that my mom used to do from, for us and my brothers, it just became kind of a mantra and, and turned into a brand somehow. Salt Wrap became, you know, the the idea behind everything we do now. Brilliant, man. Brilliant. That's lovely to have a, a nice story behind the name as well. And I have, I have to say, I, I, when you were saying that, I was thinking about, you know, I, I got injured a lot in my career. I used to, I was so frustrated about that. I, you know, I had many of the, oh, what if kind of moments and all that. But I actually think I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today without that. And I, and I know that's the same for you. And it's obviously driving you in your mission. You're trying to help people not get through those things. Yeah. I mean, the same thing I tell our clients, um, it's true for me. You know, I look at what I'm doing right now and I love what I'm doing. I wouldn't be here if I hadn't just been constantly injured, you know, and that's the business model that broke my body down every way imaginable and then try to figure out how to fix it so I can help people prevent doing the same things. And now it's, you know, you know, this is, this is better than I can imagine as far as a purpose and uh, a way of working that helps people and uses my experiences. So yeah, I'm, I'm grateful for all that stuff now. Absolutely. And I think it's the only way to live. There's a, there's a great quote that by Leonard Cohen, the singer, and he said, there's a crack in everything. That's where the light gets in. And that really spoke to me when I saw this beautiful book. That's me holding it up there for those of you watching us on YouTube, Bill from Broken a science-based guide to healing painful joints, preventing injuries, and rebuilding your body. And we are joined today by the author of that and the founder of Salt Wrap, Scott Hogan. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Aiden.